Welcome on this very, very beautiful, warm, sunny afternoon, and you are in for such a very special treat. Um, I already started my day with Aaron and a treat. Um, I found an old chair in the office and decided that it would be better placed outside over here for the afternoon because it was so beautiful out. And I printed out two short stories by Aaron. One is one um, you're going to hear today. And I just sat in the chair there and I read his two stories. And um, when I finished, he happened to be sitting in his office and I went up to him and I took a chair and I sat down and I'm I said, what have you done to me today? What have you done? And he was kind enough to talk to me about the stories. The one that he's going to be reading for you today is called Inside Voice, which is just wonderful. And I laughed and laughed and laughed as I read it. Then he wrote another one, which I hope someday he will share with us, also called No Matter the Monster. And I may be asking him if I can use that two years down the line in my gothic and horror <laughs> course, because it was um, really interesting. And I think what Aaron has, was able to do, and what I felt, and what I think that um, you will be able to feel today, is that regardless of some of the darkness in his stories, what struck me the most was that um, they were filled with caring and with love from some very flawed characters, the characters whose love for each other in these family dynamics was so powerful and so strong that as much as I was laughing out loud, I felt this sort of pain and hurt and, and sadness for them. And that's some of my favorite kind of literature um, all the time. And I talk to that about with students in literature class that we want something that's sort of transformative and, and captures the human condition in some way. And what Aaron has done is in ways that are so personal and so evocative of scenes that we have all experienced in our own lives um, that I think that's what's going to come across for you. Aaron has been with us here at Newbury College for three years. He has been instrumental in bringing to us poets and writing workshops and shared his students' work with us, which has been a wonderful addition here. He has written critical interpretations uh, from the Harold Bloom series, some of which uh, many of us who will teach literature have used on Toni Morrison, Franz Kafka, among others. He has had short stories published in Opium, the Carolina Quarterly, Wor Words and Magic, which is online where you can listen, and that's one of the first short stories I listened to, uh, to from Aaron about a man on the subway in Boston, which was absolutely wonderful. <coughs> he has published um, literary criticism and studies in American humor. He has been the winner of the Glimmer Train Story Short Story Award for New Writers. Um, today's short story that he's going to be reading for you was a finalist in a recent short story um, contest. He is in the final stages of a novel, which I hope some of you will ask a question about. Um, so what is this going to be about? He was the recipient of Uni um, uh, the University of Rhode Island, uh, Rhode Island's Distinguished Graduate Student Scholar um, Achievement Award for both scholarship and for teaching. He uses magical realism um, when, he, when he makes the ordinary into the extraordinary and back again as a mark of his fiction. He asked me um, today, just as Robert Quad <laughs> asked me a couple of weeks ago, if um, he needed to censor anything out of his writing, and especially because he's going to have a young man, one of our students, reading along with him. I assured him that Leroy was comfortable with the words that he had to read, and that you would be also. He's also given this wonderful opportunity for Leroy. This is a great tandem here. You may have heard Leroy read last year at who uh, last fall, if the, he was a member of Aaron's um, creative writing workshop, and Leroy just had a spellbound with his, um, not only with the poetry, but with his presentation of it, the true artist, an actor <coughs> in our midst. 
And um, Leroy is a second year communications student, and Aaron is going to talk just a little bit about him. How grateful he is to be able to pull this together. Um, the two of them are searching and seeking for answers in their writing and in their lives and in their music. And Leroy has been on this quest this year. And to have Aaron as a mentor through that is just wonderful. So I give you Aaron Tilden. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, now I know it's such a miserable day, so it's nice to be inside <laughs> out of the dangerous sunshine. Uh, so I have a few things. I'm going to start with a little bit of a talk on uh, crafting fiction in general, specifically how cultural trends can inspire creative writing. And this is sort of a placeholder image. I actually intended to start with an image that responds to um, the image that my colleague Dan Green started with. He gave a tremendous talk in the fall, started with a water molecule. So I have a response to that, and I'll get to that. But since I have this on the screen, uh, sometimes I just like the people watch, uh, and I'm talking about how cultural trends can inspire creative writing, and I'm thinking more in terms of short stories, I do want to just emphasize the importance of, of observing your surroundings, of, of having writer sensitivities, thinking about the things that are around you, identifying patterns. Not only those things that are around you, but the things that are in the papers, uh, on the computers, and a lot of those things can inspire stories. And I'll try to demonstrate that with two examples. One is just a brief example, and the other will be the story that Leroy and I will read. So here's the image that I had in response to Dan Green's piece. He had a water molecule, I figured I would go with an iceberg, you know, <laughs> to something uh, larger. But um, I do want to get to the relevance of the iceberg when it comes to fiction, and those who are in my uh, creative writing class have probably heard me talk about this. Uh, comes from what's commonly referred to as Ernest Hemingway's iceberg theory, and fortunately it doesn't come across too well. Well, what it says is, if a writer of prose knows enough about what he is writing about, uh, he may omit things that he knows, that, uh, sorry, that he knows, and the reader, if the writer is writing truly enough, will have a feeling of those things as strongly as though the writer had stated them. The dignity of movement of an iceberg is due to it, uh, only one-eighth of it being above water. It's kind of ironic how wordy that is, considering it's often thought of as a theory of omission. But, it's, um, <laughs> but the general idea is this, that the writer needs to know all of this stuff, but the story is really what's above the surface. And attempts to capture all of this or to put too much of that above the surface becomes more like explanation and other things. And if you have not enough of it above the surface, then you leave your readers um, too bewildered. So there's some kind of balance. I do, to some degree, uh, intend to challenge the iceberg theory with um, the story that Leroy and I will be reading, since part of what um, is beneath the surface in this story also kind of speaks, and, and I'll get to that in just a little bit. So uh, there's the iceberg theory. Um, I want to start with uh, an example of a cultural trend that I was, was noticing recently. And this is really within the last uh, few months. I, it's, not, it's not a recent trend. This is a cartoon sort of dealing with nepotism. You've got a great TV, but you aren't quite what we're looking for. And it's Jones and Sons, of course. And the idea of nepotism is not new. But um, the paranoia over nepotism, at least in the circles that I've been uh, hanging out in recently, seems to have heightened. So it occurred to me that, I mean, it's not the first time it's occurred to me, but it's not as if the degree, uh, you're naturally entitled to a job. You have to work hard to earn that degree, but you also have to work hard in other ways. And we're lucky here at Newberry to have our career fair and to have a lot of personalized attention to help, help us um, through that other side, which is not always as, as comfortable. And as I was processing this, a friend of mine forward, forwarded me a, uh, a new story, The Ten Most Overpaid Jobs. And I don't know if that was sort of a, a bitter response or something along those lines. And this article from the US, from US News and World Report in, uh, this past March was basically talking about jobs that might not need to exist, that pay enormous amounts of money. 
And I married that with a job with a, a listing that I came across, Life as a Captive of the Job Market uh, from the Chronicle of Higher Education, which came out in February. And it was essentially uh, someone with a PhD who was having a lot of difficulty with the job market, um, was, you know, worked very hard, but there was a very competitive field. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to kind of marry these two worlds in a story, these things I had seen um, around me? So I started to come up with a story idea. Um, which now I'm in the process of revising, I guess you could say. So here is the way this, this began. Um, Ari has a master's degree, and this is just the idea, but can't find a suitable job. He lacks the stomach to create opportunities for himself. Ari's friend Frankie has nothing but stomach, and from Ari's perspective, makes far too much money. Frankie likes to treat his overeducated and unemployed friend Ari to lunch and offer occupational advice among other acts of humiliation, mm -hmm. and Ari simply can't refuse a free lunch, you know, who can, right? Uh -huh. So what's beneath the surface, thinking about the iceberg, and I'll, I guess uh, for lack of a better method, I'll read this part to you to the sound screen. What's beneath the surface? What bothers Ari most is his friend's relative success. It took Frankie as many years to scrape by with a bachelor's degree and a sub-three sub GPA as it took Ari to earn two degrees with near-perfect transcripts. Yet somehow, it is Ari who is desperate to land a job that would barely pay him enough to eat, and Frankie seems to have no end to his income, and an assistant who makes almost double what Ari hopes to earn in a year. The whole situation has undermined Ari's notion of the way the world should work. So rather than uh, think about what he can do more, Ari's sort of focused on uh, his jealousy of his friend, and of course his friend is a little unsavory. So um, that led me to what's above the surface. So this is what's being shown. In this case, uh, I'm showing things that are meant to serve as um, you know, characterization. We're starting to characterize uh, Frankie and Ari in this one little scene um, that I'll read. So here it goes. I'll tell you how to get off the schneid and get it started. Get what started, Ari is compelled to ask, smoothing a stained napkin over his lap. You know what I mean, Frankie says, moving his hips in the most unsavory air, humping motion Ari could imagine at a cramped table in a public restaurant, the spectacle lasting beats too long. When he stops, he steadies his eyes. Get a job at a pet shop. Ari let his narrow shoulders slump. I'm telling you, Frankie says, giving the top of his slick black hair a pat, pet shops where the lonely chicks go to mate. Actually, Ari answers, washing down the last bite of a summer roll, I think it's the chickens that make, or the chicken and the hen, that's how the chicks are born. Your parents never had that talk with you? I think they skipped that one for the get a job and pay your own way talk. <laughs> and this goes on. Um, the next step is Ari gets a job at a pet store. You know, it has to be. Uh, you have to determine, though, when you're writing, how he could rationalize this choice, one that he might see as potentially humiliating, and then make it happen. And of course, uh, once the circumstances are in place, the details start to take care of themselves. By the end of the story, Ari, sh Ari should change for better or worse. And more importantly, the writer should learn and hopefully reveal something about this issue. So it's a matter of perspective that, that ideally um, would rise to the surface and you could portray that. So for the, uh, the story that, we're, um, that Leroy and I are reading today, I also noticed a, a trend in the news, and this is sort of a transitional slide, since we have, in this case, um, someone, an older person with a PhD hanging with his diploma on the wall of his childhood room. The idea is that he's moving back in with his parents, and you see his parents' expression. So um, it's less about the degree than about adults living with their parents, and that's something that, again, about a year ago, um, that was just something in my head. I started seeing it. I, again, it starts with personal experience. I know people who, you can argue, are too old to be living with their parents. And um, yet they are. And it gets you thinking about certain things. Some of those patterns get echoed in the news. So uh, again, about a year ago, um, from the USA Today and Time Magazine, adult kids living at home on the rise across the board. And being 30 and living with their parents isn't lame. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, of course. Why not? So um, these, uh, <clears throat> these ideas were circulating in my head, and I put them together uh, for an initial draft of the story that, that Leroy and I are going to read. And I'm very grateful to Newberry College for supporting that effort. I was able to present 
uh, the initial ideas for that story, the draft of that story at the Popular Culture Association, American Culture Association annual conference that took place in Boston last April. So just a year ago is when the, this story first started to take shape, and now it has evolved, and hopefully it's evolved in a good way. Um, we'll see. So I, I can't get into, uh, I can't, sorry, ooh, I skipped that. Something here. I can't talk about fiction without at least mentioning Chekhov and um, Chekhov's gun. So, uh, if in the first act you hung a pistol on the wall, then in the following one it should be fired. Otherwise, <laughs> don't put it there. You know, and my creative writing students have heard me say that before. And um, in this story, uh, Leroy will be reading the part of the gun. Um, let's see. How that works. But uh, so we're making our way toward uh, the piece of short fiction called Inside Voice. Uh, I have to say, I'm not only grateful for Newberry for the opportunity to, to read this here, but I'm grateful to Leroy for, um, for participating in this. Um, as Debbie mentioned, uh, a sophomore communication student, Leroy is a very talented writer and a gifted reader, uh, performer. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm very grateful that he's willing to take part as I think. You will be too. So, um, why don't we cut to it? I'm going to turn this off. I hope that's okay. We can have a, I hope that works. Oh, it really wants me to confirm. Good. Okay, so I'm going to start with the story. I, I should also say I, I did ask um, Debbie about censorship and. Um, Leroy is reading a character. Um, just so you know, not that it's so bad. I set these things up. They could be challenging. So, all right, thank you again. Um, and here is Inside Voice. Marty took his beer down to the basement, maybe the last time he would have the place to himself, and dropped into his leather chair, posture defeated casual. If Claire's brother had nowhere to go, nowhere to sleep at night, Marty would be the first one to offer up their home, he tried to convince himself taking a swig of his beer and losing some on his chin when he thought of how many homes Claire's brother owns. But seeing an embezzlement scandal or something, he tried to reason, wiping his face with the back of his hand. Money could have come from Madoff, he charged with a smug shake, not bothering with a flaw in the fantasy. Years had passed since the Madoff scandal and Claude keeps getting richer. But family was family, and if Claire's brother needed a place to stay, Marty wouldn't grill his wife about how long the arrogant, homeless, rich prick bastard needed to stay. But Jake was his own story. Only eight years old when Marty left for college. Marty barely knew his brother, and now he was moving in. Jake arrived at midnight. He had enabled a flight out of his parents and asked to be picked up at the airport. To add to the arrangement, Jake didn't own a cell phone. How that was possible in the 21st century, Marty couldn't understand. So Marty had to circle slow, stupid laps around Logan until he saw him. His own parents compressed in this mockingly nonchalant man. His mother's length and easy gait could be seen from shuttle lengths away. His father's dark eyes and casual smirk more evident up close. Marty pulled over and waved wildly from his car. Jake extended a single nod, making Marty feel even more foolish for his exuberance. After initial questions about the flight from Columbus, Marty just pointed out landmarks, Charles River, Fenway, Jamaica Pond, you really like JP, until they got home. Claire made up a great space for you, Marty said as they entered the house, plenty of privacy. Hey, Jake answered back, eyes as steady as they had been since he arrived. Wi-Fi? Uh, yeah, <laughs> right on. BBC entry, Chronicles of Free JK. Moving day, peeps. Time to hang the tapestries, bust out the lava lamp, put up the beer lights, maybe dust off the dartboard and tack up the bikini calendar. Or maybe I should just let these styly pad be for a few days. And yes, peeps, a styly pad it be. Can't really college dormitize this sort of place. Wouldn't want to disturb the shrine to modern day manhood. What does it say when the poshest pad in the palace is the host's basement? Let's listen. Yes, this basement speaks. Entertain yourself, it says. Shut down, bury your head in the mail order sand. Enjoy a beverage. The fridge is stocked with beer. Pop open one of the single side snacks on the side table package and preserve for your pleasure. Host paradise, peeps. But you can't put up any posters because it's a super sized flat screen TV on the wall. Technology owns all decorative space. The floor? 
couch and recliner made of sleek black animal eyes. The air never smells so much leather and glade in my life. <laughs> Truth be told, I'm afraid to go to sleep. Might suffocate in the fumes of suburbia. Or I have a nightmare about being trapped in a prison of perfume magazines and home good catalogs. <laughs> Who could blame me for indulging just a bit? Yes, indeed, this entry is brought to you by a refreshing cocktail of high-speed wireless and beer. It's all I can do to stop myself from talking to the leather chair. Hello, chair. <laughs> the first few days were awkwardly uneventful. This relative stranger was living in their home and Marty was in charge of them. Claire had made that clear, setting him up in the basement, a dweller in Marty's man cave. For misuse, overuse, and uselessness, Claire gushed when man cave was put on the annual list of words banished from the Queen's English, her reaction equal parts violent and erotic. Despite having a perfectly good guest room, Claire was unwavering about the arrangement, and Marty had to choose his battles, having already fought for his brother's predetermined stay. Claire used her compassionate voice to claim it would give Marty more time to get to know his brother, to help his brother, which Marty understood as expedite his exit out of the house. <laughs> the price he had to pay for this new burden on the family, no more personal, private space. She didn't dare object when he stocked the basement fridge with beer. Once Jake's stay was confirmed, Marty's dad had thanked him in a meandering email, closing with a cryptic blast, enough to fill Marty with emotional shrapnel. Your brother needs a little push. Your mother and I need a reassuring place for him to stay. Since you have kids, I know you'll understand that it's best not to believe things lying too loose. <laughs> what was lying too loose? Was he talking about himself or about Jake? About parental responsibilities or prized possessions? Should they chain the crystal to the countertop? <laughs> what Jake had done, or was capable of doing, was a colossal mystery to Marty. His parents had always been vague about their second chance son, but it never bothered him before they insisted that he help them out, relieve them of the burden of their own child, who as a 30-year-old college graduate should be taking care of himself. Before they sold their home for a retirement resort on the Carolina coast, Marty was able to glean a few things from his father. Jake had been fired from the only job he had ever had, dumped from the only relationship he had ever known, and was now embroiled in some computer project that his father claimed was a private and rewarding expression of his creativity and intelligence. <laughs> Claire was convinced it was gambling or pornography. Whatever it was, it kept him in the basement most hours of the day and night. Riding a wave of impatience, he asked again about his brother's computer project. Must be something important, Marty added. Jake shifted in his seat, appearing to contemplate whether or how to respond. You know, you ask me all these questions, but you've hardly told me squat about you, other than you can't even consummate a relationship with yourself. Why don't you tell me more about those dreams of yours, bro? What are your dreams? Where are you now, Marty? At the end of most nights, whether he was talking to his brother or not, Marty would slip into the bedroom as quietly as possible, but the effort to be quiet the cerebral strain involved, was enough to wake Claire up. On a night when, she fe when he felt thwarted at every turn, Marty pushed open the door and braced himself for the worst. Claire was still awake, reading on top of the covers. She was in her blue silk nightgown, her leg exposed to the thigh. She put her book down, her head angled into the soft light of her bedside lamp. She bit her lip. You know I'm trying, right, Marty? She said. Her eyes were soft, matching her sleepy pillow voice. Marty was reminded of how things used to be in the D.C. age, before children. Her vulnerability, her capacity for tenderness. But as a true product of his age, he steeled himself against sentimentality and stuck to his defense. You put my brother in the basement, Claire, he said, walking to his dresser. He claimed it was so we could bond, but come on. Then out of nowhere, as if his brother had cued the line himself, how long will it take before we're completely honest with each other? You're trying to punish me, Claire. It's not all about you, she shot back in her whispery, yelling voice, eyes straining against emotion. I wanted to give you time to spend with your brother, time to help him. But yes, if you think there's a selfish reason here too, you're right. Only it's not to punish you. I thought if you weren't in the basement with your brother, you might be with me, rather than disappearing at the end of every day. I never see you, that's all you seem to do. Marty was struck by the sincerity and accuracy of her statement. The truth really did hurt him. He moved back to the edge of the bed and sat, his eyes falling to Claire's bare thigh, still so supple, still so firm. I can do more now, 
he said, reaching for Claire's knee, exercising a remarkable ability to put aside any tensions or humiliations <laughs> for the possibility of sex. You're unbelievable, Claire said, squirming away from him. Why does it have to be all or nothing with you? It's either sex or silence, never any conversation, never any intimacy. And you think I don't try? I made lamb for your vegetarian brother. I put snacks on his bedside stand, and you act like I'm an intruder with some insidious agenda. What do you want, Claire? Marty sighed, leaning off the edge of the bed. I want him to leave the house. He's always here. It's not healthy. Where do you want him to go? And please don't say to work. Anywhere. Take him to a bar or something. I don't care. It's not like you're here even when you're here. Maybe he'll tell you something real if he doesn't think his enemy is sleeping upstairs. Marty knew he should offer an olive branch here, assure his wife that she wasn't the enemy. But all he could muster was, okay, I'll see if he wants to hit the bar. <laughs> Marty was in a deep sleep when Felix woke him up that morning, the three o'clock darkness all around him. Why does the night take so long, his son demanded. Why does it always take so long? Jake shrugged when asked about the bar. It was a Thursday night, and Marty had said in front of Claire that they would go around the corner. But when they got in the car, Marty had his mind set on Jamaica Plain. I think you'd like it there, he said, affecting a benevolent tone. I know a good pub. When they got to the bar, Marty gave his credit card to the bartender and carried tall drafts to, to a table by the window. Right on, Jake said when they settled in. A tab. <laughs> Marty's plan was to loosen his brother up with alcohol, get him to talk while imbibing a bit himself. It would all be guilt-free as long as he came back with something to report. The banter remained light as the beers continued to flow, the alcohol loosening the reins on both of their inhibitions. It was less noticeable in Jake at first, until the server stoked the fires of vanity. Another round for my brother Marte, Jake said to the smiling <laughs> server. And another round for my brother J.K., Marty followed, feeling as light as he had in years. Free J.K., yo, Jake shot back. Free J.K., repeated the server, turning to look directly at Jake. You're not free J.K., Jake raised suave, squinty eyes to the light, unable to hide the stupid thrill of recognition. You heard of me? My whole house, she answered. We're like obsessed with your blog. Is that your brother? <laughs> One and only, he answered, turning to face the ghostly confused Marty, whose expression was enough to wipe the cocky charm from Jake's face. But no need to get into all that now, he said. Just the drinks, trying to wave the topic away. You got it, she said, turning back to the bar. You have a blog, Marty asked, once the server had left. That's what you do on the computer all day? Jake let the question linger as Marty leaned back in his chair. You're telling me the guy who doesn't own a cell phone has an online presence? The complexion of Jake's face changed when Marty took out his smartphone. And all along, I assumed you were billing porn to mom and dad's credit card, or running a pyramid scheme or something. Glad you thought so highly of me, Jake said, eyes on his brother's phone. Ah, uh, listen. Marty paused to look up, stealing his father's smirk straight from his brother's face. I probably can't ask you to just, you know, lay off the whole internet search. Your choice, Marty answered. I've been asking about your grand computer project for a while. Looks like now's the time, Mr. Free JK, yo. <laughs> Jake raised his hand to summon the server back to the table. We're going to need a picture, I think, and uh, a few shots. You two are having fun, she smiled, her wide lips not lost on either of them. <laughs> After downing their shots and sipping their beers, Marty opened his hands to instigate the conversation. Jake leaned over the table. Okay, he said. So it's like this. You happen to be sitting with one of the founding members of DBC, he, he began. In fact, he followed with a certain pride, I write the most popular blog on the site. Well, that clarifies things, Marty said, taking a sip of his beer. Except one small thing. What the hell's the DBC? Just DBC, not the DBC. And it's an organization. Dependence by choice. <laughs> We're a network. There's a few of us who keep up a regular blog. Dependence by choice, Marty said. What kind of bogus bullshit is that? It's not bogus and it's not bullshit. We're products of the system. We've got a mission. A mission to willfully leech off hardworking relatives and friends? <laughs> Not all hardworking, Jake said. Look at you. <laughs> Marty let a hot hand slide over his face, unable to see the humor just yet. 
He shook his head. I don't get it. What kind of mission could you possibly have? Or are you still trying to figure out your whole freeloader philosophy? We're well past the mission stage, bro, he clarified, more earnest than Marty would have expected. We're an established organization, an innovative group making a real statement to the masses. We take our cues from, like, Gandhi and Martin Luther King and the Freegans and people like that. It's no joke. Come on, Marty countered. If anything's a joke, this is a joke. Or it's the serious mission of teenagers and 20-year-olds. But you're 30. What are you, the elder statesman like Frank the Tank? <laughs> We're college graduates, bro. Middle to upper class adults who graduated college and have vowed to remain dependent. Some of them have never paid for rent or food in their lives. The inviolate. They have a sacred place in our institution. Marty shook his head, pouring himself a sloppy glass from the pitcher. We're a diverse group, Jake was compelled to add. The situations vary, but they all point to the same thing. We live in a dependent age, bro, an age of avoidance. No conflicts, no complications, just medications and playdates. Keep the kids on the teeth. That's the name of the game. Our independence has been taken from us since the day we were born. Can't even get the chicken nuggets by ourselves. <laughs> Marty put his beer back on the table and let an exasperated laugh sputter out his nose. If the powers that be insist on taking care of us, then we need to let them, Jake continued. We're naming this thing, Marty. We're sending a message. By living at home with mommy and daddy? Not everyone lives at home. Some have parents or guardians who pay their rent and give them an allowance and stuff like that. I think I'm one of the first to move in with a sibling. You should be honored. Claire's going to throw up. Let's focus on tonight then, bro, Jake suggested, leaning back in his chair. Just you and me, here, tonight. Give us time to process it all. Marty should have gone home after Jake disclosed his ambitions to be ambitionless, but when he received Claire's text, any breakthroughs? Even Marty, who may have been the butt of the DBC joke, couldn't bear to go home. Claire's next communique came a half hour later. In bed, do not wake me up. Marty replied with a night love and ordered another round of shots. After last call on the server, Stacy invited them to her house, Marty was happy to reluctantly agree. My housemates are going to freak, she said, leading them down the street to her apartment, just a short stumble away from the bar. More than Marty could have imagined, Stacy's housemates did freak. They were welcomed as celebrities, free JK and the host, and Clive with drinks and joints. Marty tried to affect an air of cool detachment, but he was drunk, and it was too easy to embrace his celebrity status, at least for the night. Young women were flirting with him. Young guys were bringing him drinks and knocking his fists. Marty got belly laughs when he told about the intern who cornered him, him to talk about the evils of advertising, yelling about how advertisers put emancipated women on the covers of magazines and used computers to make women look more emancipated. Not sure this is what Lincoln had in mind when he signed the proclamation, he roared, rolling over himself, gasping and snorting as he hadn't done in years. Even Jake had tears. As the night wore on and Marty started to teeter on the edge of consciousness, one of the women pulled him toward her room. Jake grabbed his arm, asking if he knew what he was doing. Your hands tonight, Marty replied with a long, sleepy grin. My turn to be taken care of. Not how it works, bro. The host has already chosen his path. Tonight I choose dependency, he slurred, stumbling back toward the bedroom. This is the night. Just you and me here tonight, he said, as a warm hand drew him into the dark shutting the door, pulling him down. The swarming, blaring sounds of Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro jarred Marty awake. It was light outside. His clothes were in a bunch on the floor. He was naked in a bed that was not his own. He leaned off the edge and grabbed his phone in a clammy hand, trying to stifle the sound of Claire's special ring. He stumbled into the hall and fumbled his way to the bathroom. Elbow on the sink, he lowered himself onto the toilet seat the insufferable song threatening never to end. But when it did, finally, resolutely, it was replaced by a grave and demanding silence, then a fierce light, missed call, Claire. He pressed the cold edge of the phone into his forehead and closed his eyes. Where am I now? Where am I now? Where am I now? BBC answered, the Chronicles of BJK. So a new turn in our twisted tale here, peeps. Let's just say I was outed a bit last night, but the host and I have a new understanding. Both of us sitting on secrets. Of course, the truth will come out in time. Things like this just do. And that's sort of the point anyway. But for now, we can just both sit back. The bright side, 
I think I've secured my spot in the house for a while. And there's so much more to learn, so much more to report. Let's start here. I had an epiphany this morning. On the silent drive back to my bro's pad, a story that may come out in time. We were in a 35 mile per hour zone, cruising along at 40 or so, when this cop car passed us doing 50 to 55. No lights, no sirens, just driving. That's when it hit me. It's not just dependency peeps, but false parameters and empty threats contributed to the dependent age, no doubt. But it's a national societal thing, I think. An epidemic. Read it, peeps. Speed limit, 35. Just don't go over 50. No parking at any time, unless you throw on your blinkers and you're just running in for a second. Or think about family speak. If you don't come here right this second, I'm leaving the store without you. How many rents have ever really left their kids in the store? <laughs> Maybe two? Now how many rents have threatened their kids with abandonment? Read it, peeps. All of them. It's what we do. And that's not it. Time's all out of whack. Think of the home place. You have five seconds to get to the table. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, three and a half. No wonder we need medics to keep kids in their seats. Words no longer work. They're no longer real. We can have, we, how can we have fidelity in our lives when it's not in the words we use or the signs we read or the laws that are meant to keep us safe? Dios mio, peace. I think I need to lie down. Where's that leather couch? Just want to sink into its soft hide. Cover my head with the styly accent pillow. Block out all that screaming upstairs. Inside voice, please. Inside voice. Free J.K. Agra. Thank you very much. And thank you. Right. I know it's such a beautiful day. I am open to questions if you're interested in asking some, but I don't, uh, you know, but I, but I understand every action and all that stuff. Uh, thank you all for, for coming here. Are there, are there questions? I'm happy to respond or if there are questions for the Lord. Yeah. How often are you writing? Do you have a routine where every day at 5.30 a.m., I, it does depend on the, uh, where we are in the semester, to some degree, uh, for me. But um, I, uh, I, I tend to write in the later hours rather than the earlier hours. For me, although I have heard of uh, those writers who have a you know very strict you know get up at five thirty and then by six thirty uh, they've, they've written an hour. Um, for me, it's uh, it's a little streakier, though it's it's uh, consistent streakiness if that makes any sense. In that. Um, I look forward to any opportunity. So I um, I will uh, write if I'm you know if I have time in the afternoons, and I will write if I have time in the evenings. And uh, if there's uh, if I'm if I've had enough coffee, I'll write in the mornings and things like that. But um, and then I know though that uh, I don't want to neglect uh, the other side of things, you know, the teaching and grading side of things, which is uh, a necessity. So. Um, for me, it's a little inconsistent. The summer is very consistent, though. You know, so that's an everyday thing, and I try to do it just about all day in some way. So, uh, and of course, with writing, it's reading too. So I, I do my best to surround myself with, um, you know, uh, pieces of literature that I think will inspire me in one way or another. And if ever I have come to a point where I am not sure what comes next, then I read. And uh, it's amazing the way the mind works. Um, and then when I'm really ambitious, I try to run, but clearly I haven't done much of that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. yeah. Debbie mentioned in your introduction that you had won an award for your short stories. What award was it? Uh, I won a uh, short story award for new writers uh, from Glimmer Train Stories, which is a journal. Uh, it's a really, it's a really good journal, and I'm not just saying that because they uh, published me. I think it might have been. Uh, Oversight or something, but the uh, but it's a it's a great journal, Glimmer Train. It comes out of Portland, but it's distributed nationally, and uh, and then I won a, a short fiction award from the University of Rhode Island, uh, Nancy Potter Short Fiction Award. Um, yeah, I was grateful for that. Yeah. Um, has I always followed Debbie's uh, suggestions here. Could you tell us about your novel? Yeah, she can. Right. Uh, yes. Um, 
Yeah, this is a uh, something that I'm, in the pro I'm still revising, but uh, you know, at times I think it's complete, and other times I don't think so. But it's uh, in one way it can be characterized as Jewish American magical realism. Uh, it has a um, certainly the central characters uh, are their Jewish American identities influence certain aspects, and um, one of the characters, um, the I, I guess I'll let me see if I can do this. Smoothly. I also mentioned Debbie that I had yeah. sometimes trouble summarizing it, but um, the, uh, there, there are two central characters, um, a Jewish American woman named Bernie, and she, her, she lost her family in sort of a uh, dark, comic, tragic way. Uh, they were, um, yeah, but uh, I won't get into that. It is, it is real, it is set in realism, and I don't make light of the fact that she lost her parents. But she and had another unfortunate circumstance, but she had a child as a single mother, and she's not at a very young age and is not necessarily prepared to, to raise him, um, not necessarily prepared to raise him. So she had to do a number of different things, and as a result, he has a, a very unique upbringing. And they make it from, uh, starts in Reno and moves to San Francisco, where a, um, a, a voice teacher, they move in with a voice teacher who's a little bit older and has a volatile temperament and sort of discovers. Uh, a talent within her son, which she's named Artland after an imaginary friend that she had as a young child. And uh, dealing with his circumstances, um, Artland has this talent, this singing talent, but uh, what's also discovered is that uh, through a certain amount of pain and dealing with a certain number of circumstances, he can also make things levitate. And what happens is his identity and his ability to uh, make things levitate is something that um, his mentor, his voice teacher, and uh, his mother want to conceal to some degree and exploit at the same time. And in my eyes, it becomes sort of a, a metaphor for Jewish American identity, which is sometimes uh, thought of as, you know, you want to be just like everyone else, only more, is the joke. Uh, so when they want to make him just like everyone else, only more, they want him to fit in and they want to talent, uh, market his talents and make it seem like he's doing music and illusions when in actuality he's... Um, making things levitate, and that sort of uh, leads, one thing leads to another, and uh, his mentor um, gets sort of off track, and everyone sort of gets off track, and Hartman has to, you know, use his abilities in other ways that are um, making the best of a bad situation toward the end, yeah, so we'll see, but it's, uh, it's um, meant to be funny, uh, and also meant to be serious at the same time, which is sort of the, that line, I think it's... Um, I think humor can be an effective way of uh, addressing serious issues, and there are certainly a number of them raised in this. And I also, I'm hoping it's uh, entertaining, and I'm hoping um, it will get published. <laughs> but not yet. <laughs> we'll see. You know anyone? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you do. I'm always curious about how um, parts of the story come along, and I'm wondering yeah. if you knew from the get-go that the brother's voice would come in the shape of the blog, or, or did that come? Yeah, you know, uh, the initial draft um, didn't have the blog there. It just had the, the idea of the blog there. So the reference to the blog and the reference to Jake and that. So when I originally put this together for the PCA-ACA conference last April, you know, and again, it was, I was about half the size, and I was just sort of working with the ideas of this dependent age that I was talking about earlier and trying to figure out how to do it. And I was slightly uncomfortable, bless you, uh, about um, how explicit um, I was being with this dependence by choice. So, and, and, and I was sort of informed by the iceberg theory. And then I realized I should just screw the iceberg theory, and uh, yeah, which I don't recommend um, in any way. But, uh, but the idea is that, and that I needed to make that voice come alive. And I, I said um, earlier, I think, you know, that Leroy would be reading the part of the gun. You know, and really that needs to go off, and I don't think it was going off in the way that it could. Uh, the explosion wasn't as big without that voice. And once I started putting that voice in, it felt uh, better to me. And I also felt like I could be more explicit um, with some of the message because it was coming from uh, a part that, you know, the narrator, or sorry, the uh, Marty wasn't necessarily aware of. So, yeah, it wasn't in the initial drafts, that, that voice, and then it started to come very naturally. In fact, I started to convert 
parts of the narrative that were in traditional narrative form into the blog and have them told from, from blog posts. And then, of course, some came up uh, you know, that just inspired other things, too. I think it was perfect. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Uh, Leroy does that. So I think makes it so. Yeah, Debbie. Uh, so, start, start. Well, I just wanted to know how the two of you connected and, Leroy, what your, um, kind of your background is and do you want to write novels and short stories? I know Debbie had mentioned acting. Um, so just how, how you decided to use, I'm assuming Leroy is one of your students, and how that also gave you audition students? Or no, uh, Leroy was the easy and obvious choice, uh, and I was grateful that he was willing to do it. I don't know if it would have been, uh, if the, you know, I mean, I'm sure others could have done uh, a good job with that, and I thought it was, it was a cool idea to have another voice, but... Um, I had, uh, yeah, uh, Leroy was in a couple of classes of mine, and uh, my creative writing class last semester, uh, he really, um, you know, emerged as a talent in a variety of different ways, and, um, and uh, Leroy gave me the uh, privilege of reading a, a poem of his after that class, too, uh, this semester, and uh, we had a reading last, uh, you know, in the fall, and we had uh, a, a, a now somebody who's become a friend of mine, a, uh, a poet, Nat Mouth, came in from Minnesota, and I decided uh, instead of having some kind of opening act, you know, one person reading, that it could be my creative writing class. And they were really up for it, and um, we sort of, some students have been, you know, we, we read aloud periodically in class anyway, and um, before we that reading, uh, everyone made it clear that they didn't want to follow Leroy. <laughs> So in that reading, uh, we also had a, a beatboxer um, uh, who did a, uh, Renee uh, Paloma, who did a, a great uh, job with that. So it was kind of interesting to do transitional beatboxing. But um, yeah, Leroy, as Debbie said, sort of uh, stunned the room, not only with uh, the power of his words, but his performance. And so when I was thinking about this, um, it was, uh, I was hoping that Leroy would be willing to be interested in that. Well, it was a very perfect fit. Both parts. Oh. Um, so what what are your your plans? I mean, are you are you actively writing now, or are you? Uh, yes. Um, I consider myself a poet, um, musician as well. Um, I think uh, poetry and music kind of coincide with each other. So um, I'm looking to be a musician, but I also write. Uh, poetry. No, It's more uh, informing the, edit the editing process. Uh, so for instance, uh, what I said might be beneath the surface was in an initial draft. Oh. And, then, um, and then I said, you know, okay, maybe that's understood. You know, maybe it's, because what's important to avoid, I think, is that those explanations, I mean, sometimes in dialogue, you know, if, if you were working with that story, um, you know, if, I wouldn't want um, Frankie to tell um, I'm trying to remember the names. Ari, I wouldn't want Frankie to tell Ari, you know, I know you're upset that you have a master's degree and you've been trying for this many years to get a job and you can't get frustrated and you think I make too much money. But, you know, uh, you know, in those types of things. But you can do it in narrative a little bit more gracefully, but, um, but I, I think it's more, yeah, informing the editing process, what I can take out. Uh, and again, there's, there are things that, as even preparing for this, although that may have seemed insufferably long to some, I don't know, the story I did edit um, even or you know, even today. <laughs> so, um, and I'm always looking, thinking along those lines, do I need this? And, and you could say you can get too much, you know. Uh, Hemingway's uh, short stories um, have been hailed as uh, brilliant and meaningless, you know. So, I, I, or, you know, they're, they're too extreme, and sometimes it doesn't quite say enough, and, um, and, and I think you need a balance of the showing and the telling and stuff like that, so. But it doesn't inform the editing process. <sighs> Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. Really thank you. <laughs> Some light refreshments. Um, sorry. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah, I really, I especially appreciate it given, given the, uh, the beautiful day, so hopefully we'll all enjoy some of that. Uh, it's not over yet.